Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Good morning. Um, I always say this. It's kind of tough sometimes to transition from worship to uh, giving a message because it's the same. We're worshiping, but I kind of want to go back and play guitar and, and sing to God. It's like one of these days, I know it's going to happen. I'm going to just chuck the message and we're just going to play and worship God the whole time. I, I can feel that already. Um, all right, so it's June, July soon, right? Can you turn me down slightly? Thank you. Don't make me go the handheld. Um, it's, can you believe it's already almost July? Six months, half the year is over already? I was just still working on the January, you know, what I'm going to do this year, and I'm trying to take, you know, the pulse of where life is right now. Our church has been here nine months and three weeks, two days, six hours, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but I was doing a check the other day. I was kind of doing, at work, you call it a SWOT analysis. You look at, you know, uh, your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats, and something Pastor Rick and I have been looking at to see, well, what's, how's the vision coming? Are we staying true to the vision? And, and we're doing this, this check. And we're kind of going over a few things, and it's good. It's good to kind of like, in the mid-year point, check the pulse of what's going on in your life. Because you start the year off thinking, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and the next thing you know it, it's going to be July, and you haven't done this, and you haven't really done that. Um, so I started thinking about, well, what happens? You have all this exuberance. I just came back a couple weeks from a, a conference in Fresno for the Church of God, and um, I came back with all this information and all this excitement and we're going to do this and yes, we're on the track of doing this and everything's going great. Oh, wait a minute. We're not doing that anymore. So, I really hope that your life is going to plan. But I'm going to talk about this morning. I'm going to kind of ask you a couple of things. So, the things that you started out in the beginning of the year and you wanted to accomplish, how's that going for you? Are things doing okay? Do you guys need to adjust anything? And I started thinking... We have this hope that starts at the beginning of the year. I, I hope this happens this year. And I hope this is the year that this is going to go away. And I hope that this is the year that God really does something great. And I hope this is the year I can start doing these things I, I always want to do. And I started noticing as I was doing this evaluation of where I am personally and where the church is, I started thinking, uh, wow, I'm not really hoping for this anymore. What happened to that? Why haven't we accomplished certain things? And I started realizing a couple of things I gave up on. And that's not good. I started thinking, why did I lose that hope? Why am I not action iteming for this? So why I just turned iteming into a verb. So why why am I not hoping for this anymore? Why did I lose hope? The most important thing that we can do is remain in that hope that God gives us, that He's in control of things, that somehow things are going to work out, that despite what happens in life, what happens in the world, the issues around us, what we may be dealing with personally, not, we cannot lose hope. I'm going to read to you Psalm 62, 5 and 6. Let all that I am Wait quietly before the Lord, before God, for my hope is in Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, and I will not be shaken. Well, if you lose hope, you might have been shaken a bit. And I want to, I want to pray for a second. Father God, I just thank you right now, Lord, for a focus, and I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that we can hear, take in our hearts and turn into action what you're, what you're telling us this morning. I pray for each person here, Lord, that there's a reason why they're here, and I just thank you, Lord, that we can just listen and absorb your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. So you look around us, and you look at the world, and you think, wow, there's a lot of things changing, there's a lot of things happening. And it seems like there's a lot of out-of-control things happening. Whether it's an event or a tragedy or something's crashing down around you or you look at life and you think, wow, there just doesn't seem to be very much hope for this world right now. For those that may not have a relationship for Jesus yet, you learn about God's will and you think, well, I don't really get it yet. And maybe you're here to learn and you're just checking out who God is. At the same time, you're also thinking... 
maybe there's hope for these world, this world and what God wants to come together. Well, there is. But that only happens when you're in a relationship with Jesus. That's how things start to make sense. See, hope is what gets us up in the morning. Every day, we say, God, you are in control. No matter what I see, no matter how I feel, it's going to be okay somehow. Amen. So, I'm going to give you nine Bible verses in six points. So, get your pens and your iPads and your smartphones and tablets and whatever. <laughs> whatever you do to take notes, I'm going to ask you to take notes. I'm going to go a little fast. So, nine verses and six points that are going to encourage us to rely on the hope of God when it seems like it's hopeless. For a moment that we might think that God is not in control, and we start to realize, yeah, in this chaos, God is in control. And to make sure that we keep that hope in our lives and we stay focused on the plans that God has for us, and we just don't give up, folks. So, um, but first I'm going to give you the definition of, of hope. I like going back to Webster's Dictionary. Um, it was actually a godly man's. I, I like a lot of the uh, perspective he puts on it. So Webster's Dictionary definition of hope. To cherish a desire with anticipation. To desire with expectation of obtainment. To expect with confidence and trust. To hope without any basis for expecting fulfillment. You got that one? A feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. Hope. Number one. The biblical definition of hope. The book of Romans chapter 8 talks about how for those people that are in Jesus, there's no condemnation. And because you belong to God, that power of the Spirit will carry you through sin and struggles and trials. Romans 8, 24 to 25. Romans 8, 24 to 25. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't have yet, we must wait patiently and confidently. That word, confidently. Very well connected to faith. Biblical hope is a confident expectation. You don't faint, you don't lose hope. Hope is a firm assurance regarding things that are unclear and maybe unknown to us, but they're known to God. Keeping the hope of God will keep us falling into despair, the opposite of hope. And today I look around, even among Christians that believe that Jesus is their Savior, you take a pulse, there's a little bit of despair going around. Does anybody feel that? You get up in the morning, you read something, you look at something, you observe something, you go, wow, things just don't look that great. The definition of despair is pretty simple. The complete loss or absence of hope. You lose hope, you abandon hope, you give up, you lose heart, you lose faith, you be discouraged, you be despondent, demoralized, you resign yourself. The feeling of, it's never going to happen, so what's the use in trying? There is no hope. And I'm going to tell you something, that's what the enemy wants. He has tried to get us to sink into this despair and give up. So I'm going to get right to it on point number two. The goal of the enemy is to make you think that things are not going to get any better. He wants you to lose hope. See, what happens to the hope that we had at the beginning of the year? You've got to ask yourself, did the enemy steal it from you? Because sometimes we can blame the enemy and sometimes, hey, look, it's our fault. But I'm going to talk, talk specifically about the enemy. Did we look around at things in the world and we look, did we look at it and say, ah, oh, things are hopeless, forget it, I'm not going to try. I'm just going to take care of myself, take care of my family, to go along my business and... Make sure that, that we're okay in our little inner circle. Because we look at terrorism and wars and poverty and prejudice and fighting over about what are the morals and values and ethics and of this world supposed to be. And we look at the abuses and the violence everywhere. 
And the enemy is trying to get you to think that the happiness in your life, that's over. It's done. Just wait for God to come back. Sit in your house. Hide. Don't be useful at all. It's done. Pray for God. Pray for Jesus to open the clouds and we're all called up. That's the thing to do right now. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 10. It says, Humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, He will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares about you. Stay alert. Watch out for the great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion waiting for somebody to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering as you are. See, it's in that kindness of God. He's called you to share his eternal glory to everyone by the means of Jesus. Even though we may suffer for a while, he's going to restore us. He's going to support us. He'll strengthen us and he'll give us that peace and put us on that firm foundation. See, the devil wants you to believe that your life or whatever situation you're going through has ruined your life so much. It's messed you up so much that things are not going to get any better. You tell yourself, my marriage is not going to get any better. My relationship with my family, a loved one, is just not going to get any better. I'm lonely. My job is horrible. My boss is horrible. My health is bad. I'm struggling with money. I'm never going to retire. I'm going to work forever. Uh, my past is too messed up. Yeah, I'm never going to overcome it. Um, it's too much damage. Uh, it's too late for me to start over. I'm going to give you a weird analogy. Bear with me because this is what came to my head. When I was praying and thinking about this message, I thought about how Satan was trying to ruin our lives. Give us a bad day sometimes. Sometimes things are going along great, and you have this moment of a morning, and I think I had one a little bit this morning when I was just a little overwhelmed. And you, and you, go, oh, you start thinking, your mind gets away from you, you start thinking, oh man, these things aren't going that great. Oh, yeah. I don't know what, why I'm trying, oh, blah, blah. And you just get this despair because of one solitary moment. I thought of Batman. <laughs> I'm a big Batman fan. I've got this great big co collection of comic books and graphic novels. Anybody a Batman fan? Hey, go Batman. But I thought about, I thought about his arch nemesis who is... Joker. A little louder? The Joker. Right. There's this graphic novel that came to my head. It's called The Killing Joke. It is this story about how the Joker, that his only point was to create mayhem. To get people to lose hope. In the movie Batman Begins, they were trying to, or excuse me, in uh, uh, The Dark Knight with the Joker, they were trying to make sense of why the Joker was so evil. Why is he so evil? There's got to be a point to this. And there's this line that says, actually, some people just want to see the world burn. There's no point to anything. Some people are just evil for evil's sake. They have no purpose other than watch the world burn. And I think there's a lot of groups in the world right now that are like that. In this story, The Killing Joke, the Joker got this idea to go around and create as much mayhem in one day. In one day to see what damage he can do to somebody's entire life, the rest of their life, to play a joke on them so bad, to do something so bad that they would hope all because of something that happened in one day. The Joker tried to create a circumstance that may have been serious or even tragic in some people's lives, in good people's lives. His specific point was to go after good people. The good people of the city. So that those people would lose hope. And he was trying to, trying to get a point. Trying to make a point of that even the best people can turn away from hope. Can turn away and give up on life because of something in their life that happens in one moment. The Joker had tried to do, in a sense, something the devil, the devil has been trying to do. And I know that's just fantasy, but the enemy is real. Think about what the devil tried to do to Job to mess up his life so bad 
that Job would just quit. And what was he trying to get Job to do? Curse God. Give up. Say it's over. I'm done. If this is loving God, if this is a godly life, then I don't want it. That's what he's trying to get people to do. So I hope you understand that analogy because I want to drive this point home. One bad moment does not ruin your entire life. The goal of the enemy is to just to do just that, to make you live in despair, to make you useless, without action, to live without gaining any ground, no victories, no hope, no expectation for anything to get better in your life, to look at a situation and say, I'm done, I'm out of the game. You may be a Christian, you may have given your life to Jesus, you may love Him, you may have this great relationship, and maybe you go to church once in a while or fellowship with other people that believe, but for the most point, you just kind of take yourself out of the game and get by day by day and say, well, you know, I'm kind of done. See, He wins the battle and achieved His goal of making you ineffective for God and ineffective for the people around you. The enemy will lose the war in the big picture, but you will actually lose a lot of small battles to him. That can be damaging in your life here on earth and possibly damage the lives of other people around you. 1 Peter 5.10 First Peter 5.10 He will restore, support, and strengthen you and he will place you on a firm foundation. See, we are here to inspire others. It's not about us. To be that example of the overcomer person that despite what they go through, no matter what the world throws at us, we placed our hope in Jesus Christ and we came out in a victory. There's one thing that Debbie and I uh, agree on whenever we fight, and you know, we fight on occasion, about once every six months, real intense fellowship. Um, <laughs> but there's one thing that always helps us, is that we stand on the same foundation. So no matter if we agree or agree to disagree, we always come back to this. The same place to say, okay, let's pray. Well, I blew that. Uh, let's pray. So we always come back to this level ground. Without that level ground, it is hopeless. No matter our disagreements, we can always fall back, stand on that same place, and it's called the truth of the Word of God. We can pray and start all over again and keep starting over again and keep starting over again until we get it right. Which leads us to number three. I think I went number two. Number three here. When life has you battle weary, weary and worn, remember the big picture. When life has you battle weary and worn, remember the big picture. Romans 5, 2 through 5. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. See, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they will help us develop endurance. Endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead us to disappointment. So remember that. Hope in God will not lead us to disappointment. Doesn't mean we don't have work to do. For we know how dearly, we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with this love. See, this is the hope that God gives us to wake up in the morning, get out of bed, and avoid saying, what's the use, and just throw the covers back over your head. See, I've told you often about Debbie and I, our struggle, and I'll use this always as uh, analogies and comparisons because um, you need to know who we are and what we're about. My wife struggles with a neurological disease. She has for 10 years. And I've said before, it's the hope of God that prevents us from giving up, from holding hands and jumping off a cliff sometimes. See, she has not seen healing yet today, but tomorrow's another day. What I don't see today doesn't mean that I'm not going to see it tomorrow. It's that hope. No matter how tough it is, we have hope. Leads us to number four. Do you lose hope when you see others around you that maybe don't have a relationship with God and you see them doing very well? Does that get to you? Do you say, you know, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I'm doing everything. And I see these people over here and the way they are. I don't get it. 
Why does it seem that at difficult times, at, during your difficult time, you can see the riches, maybe the fame, the prosperity, or just the plain good things that happen to these people of the world that doesn't happen to you? Why does it work out for them, not for me, after all I'm doing? Is that making you lose hope? Proverbs 23, 23, written by Solomon, who God calls the wisest man. He prayed for the wisdom. He was giving advice like the way a father would give advice to a son. In Proverbs 23, 17 to 18, he says, Don't end these sinners, but always continue to fear. Biblically, that means more respect. I'm not afraid of God, but hey, I respect His power. You will be rewarded for this. Your hope will not be disappointed. Remember, all that fame and success and these things that are going on in the world and all this celebration for things that you see going on and these victories that you see the world claiming, those are fleeting. Those are temporary. That's not going to last. And your commitment to trying to live life in a godly manner according to His Word, the way God wants you to, according to His will, see, that's going to be rewarded. That's what gives you hope. That leads me to number five. How we treat people who may not know Christ and live in ways that are not in line with the Word of God. I'll give you two verses for this one. We are to be Jesus. Plain and simple. We are to pray that even though not everybody chooses God's will in ways and they don't get it, they don't see it, and it's frustrating at times, we are to get out of the way. We are to get out of the way and hope that they can come to know who Christ Jesus is and who they are meant to be in that truth. Romans 12, 9 through 21. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. I'm going to do that one more time. <laughs> Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. See, you can hate what is wrong. You can hold tightly to what is good. You can take God's word and hold on and go, but this is truth. But you're supposed to love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. hope. Be patient in trouble. Keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. But what about those people who don't know the Lord? Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Harmony. Great word. Great name. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of humble, ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. See, we as Christians, we can get in this thing. Oh, these people are so blind. Oh, if they could only see. If they only knew what I knew. If they were just as wise as we are. <laughs> No, we're all sinners. We all mess up. Sin is sin. We have things to work on too, folks. See, you are to never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Us praying and us loving people is going to speak a lot louder than us condemning them. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, our job, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. By doing this, you're heaping burning coils, coals of shame on their head. And I know that sounds kind of harsh, but if you're ever in a situation where you know you're wrong, and somebody comes at you with truth, it is like, oh, yeah, I really messed up, didn't I? Man, was I wrong. Don't, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer, conquer evil by doing good. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to give you the second Bible verse. Titus 2, 11 through 13. You know what I really miss? Page turning. You know, I, I love the iPads and iPhones, so I, I miss... 
For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and a devotion to God. Why do we get that devotion to God? Because why we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. See, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I think that says it all. Number six. Where do we get this hope? It's my last point. Where do we get this hope? When we're overcome by all the things that go on in the world and we just get really beat up, we're just going, oh, so frustrating. How do we overcome that despair that can creep into our lives? There are times in the illness that my wife has been dealing with and I just tell you, I never want to say Debbie's sickness or Debbie's illness. I don't claim anything like that. Uh, I don't, we don't own this thing. We give it to God, let Him deal with it. But there are times in our walk that we do feel a little bit of despair. We do feel a little moments of no hope. So where do we go to get this hope? Where do we get recharged? Hebrews 6, 13 through 19 for example, there was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name, saying. And basically, God was making an agreement, an oath he was swearing to us. His word was his word. He's bound by himself according to what his word says. You see, this is what verse 18 says. So God has given us both His promise and His oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to Him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is strong and trustworthy. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. We get hope because God gives us hope. Period. He says, I'm your hope. And if God says it, hey, we should believe it. It's good enough for us. It's going to anchor us. It's going to make us down in this firm foundation when everything looks like it's just going crazy. We can hang out of the hope that we have in God and we don't have to live in despair and we don't have to give up. See, not all the problems we have are immediately going to go away. But God's word will at least give you that foundation to start over. Or at least start moving forward. To get you to a place where you trust God so much that no matter what the circumstance is, you have hope. Jeremiah 29 through 11. 29 11. Uh, this is one of the most popular verses ever. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. These plans are for good not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. That's where we get our hope from. See, the more you read the Bible, the Word of God, and this isn't a spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't read all the way through the Bible, but um, in case you haven't read the Bible all the way through, God wins. <laughs> Titanic sinks. Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. <laughs> Sorry. And God's will and ways will come to fruition. They will be done. Now, I'm not going to rest in that because you can get a little, <laughs> see, I told you, you know, we're right. No. Stay humble in that. Stay humble to know that by God's might and power, His will will be done. Now and through eternity. That alone should give you the hope, that faith in God.